good. Are we live? Up and running? Okay, we'll pray and we'll begin tonight's class. We'll be following up from last, well, two weeks ago, when we began to look at the book of uh, Isaiah. And I'm echoing quite a bit. It's amazing. I wonder why I'm echoing more tonight than normal. Maybe because <laughs> there's not as many people tonight. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so tonight we're going to continue from Isaiah. We began looking at this two classes ago. We did not have a class last Monday. So we're behind one class, and I'll try and make that up next week. So let's pray, and I'll begin. Father God, we thank you, and we praise you, Lord, for the freedom, Lord, that we yet have to study your word and to, to devote our lives to you, your kingdom, and the hope of your son, Yeshua, reigning in the earth. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would use us Fill us, O oh Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Give us insight, revelation. Help us, O oh Lord, to be your vessels in this awesome, incredible time. Use us for your glory, O oh God, we pray. Amen. So I want to just, a uh, little bit of housekeeping before we get into, the, get into tonight's class. We have five more classes, including tonight's class. So after tonight's class, we have four more classes. The last class will be on June 24th. Normally, we will end middle of June. I've extended it one extra class because of the fact that we lost a class last Monday when Sandra Barrett was here. So we're going to go to June 24th. I think we have enough classes to, to get to the end of Prophets 1. When we resume next semester, we'll resume with Prophets 2, and we'll keep going until we get to Prophets 3. Prophets 3 is where it gets all eschatological. That's where it gets really into uh, current events, how Bible prophecy relates to current events. So let's begin. I think I had this word up on the board for us. I've got to, I've got to move a little slower than normal. The, the camera has to keep up with me. So we're still in Prophets 1, yes. Um, class, this is actually still class two. And we're, we're looking at Isaiah. Okay, and we had this word up last week or week before. Anyone knows what word I'm going to put on the board right now? The word is Yeshayahu, Yeshayahu. Let's see if I get this right, Yeshaya. Yahu, which of course is Isaiah. How do you get to Isaiah from Yeshayahu? I have no idea. And here's another prophet. In this section of prophecy that we're looking at, we're dealing with prophets that were early warning prophets. And here's another prophet in this period. Correct. Eliyahu. Eliyahu. Eliyahu, which is Elijah. So Eliyahu. Elijah. What's the word Elijah mean? Eliyahu. My God is Yah, or the God of Israel is my God. Eli, Yah, or Eli is God. El, God, Eli, my, Eli, Yahu. My God is Yah, or Yahovah or the God of Israel. So, we're going to overcome the incredible echo in the room tonight because it's quite, quite echoing. And we're going to pick up from where we left off last, well, two, two Mondays ago. We're going to continue in looking at the book of Isaiah. We said that the book of Isaiah can be divided or can be 
categorized in three sections. If we remember what we talked about, section one, chapters one to thirty-five. What was the what we talked about this? What was the essence of the first section? What was the main focus of the first section? A lot of yes. A lot of indictments against against Israel, the, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There were also some, in that first section as, as well, some indictments against the nations, even nations in the future, from Isaiah's point in time. So a lot of Bible prophecy in there as well, what we would call prophecy. Isaiah 36 to 39 was all very contemporaneous, no prophetic message no revelational message. You remember we said that there are three types of message, or three types of messages, and they were, you had prophetic messages, revelational messages, and contemporary or contemporaneous messages. And we understand the difference between those three. Okay, so in, in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter, which is the first section, Isaiah 1 to 35, we have a lot of prophetic messages uh, dealing with events that will occur in the future as it relates to Israel, as it relates to all the nations. And we also have some revelational messages in that section as well and contemporary messages as well. But as it relates to 36 to 39, what is 36 to 39 about? Who remembers? <coughs> Isaiah 36 to 39 had to do with Sennacherib, the Assyrians who ultimately destroyed Samaria in the north after having lead, uh, laid siege to, to Samaria in the north. Uh, Sennacherib decided that he was going to march south, come up to Jerusalem, and take Jerusalem. God never ordained that he should. And Isaiah 39, uh, well actually 30. 30, uh, 36 to 39, tells the story of when the Assyrians came up to Jerusalem. At that time, Hezekiah was the king in Judah, and Isaiah was the prophet. And you should read this and really study it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you have done that. You've done it already. Uh, to this point, you should have. So it's a fascinating little read there, telling the whole story of that encounter between Hezekiah, Sennacherib, the, the Assyrians, and Isaiah. Ultimately, the, let's just say the Assyrians lost. And then the final section, which is what we will look at tonight, of the book of Isaiah, is Isaiah 40 to 66, which, from my perspective, is the most fascinating and incredibly relevant uh, uh, section of the book of Isaiah, relevant to who we are as Christians, what we call Christians, relative to who we are as disciples in Messiah Jesus, a people who are not a people called out from every kindred, tongue, and nation to be a people, we are definitely, uh, we are definitely reviewed or, or pictured in Isaiah chapter, in this third section of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40 to 66. We, the, 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 the picture of, our, of, of the church is presented over and over in this section, the last section. So let's, let's begin. I, think, I, I, don't, I don't think we actually began to look at this section yet. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. We might have discussed some of it, did we? We did the first six, right. All right. So we, we were on message five. Okay, so let's just recap here quickly because there's a, there's a consistent theme here that I want to catch for us. So we looked at Isaiah chapter 40, which is the first message, 40 to 41. We saw there that God was going to raise up a people that will speak comfort to Israel and that will be, be instrumental in what God will ultimately begin to do in the restoration of Israel. And so that, and then, and then the second, the second message in Isaiah chap, in Isaiah, uh, the, the third section of Isaiah, the second message there has to do with God's servant. And we read and we looked at this, and we saw that God's servant can certainly be Israel. In fact, is Israel, but also the church as well, and that the church 
is very much included. And that's, that's why I say that Isaiah 40 to 66 gives us a, a perspective, uh, a view of believers in Messiah Jesus, disciples, what we call Christians. Remember what we talked about in regards to the mystery of the book of Isaiah, right? We have 66 chapters. We have 66 books in our Bible. 66 books didn't exist in the Roman Catholic Bible or other Bibles that came before it, even Bibles that came after it. But what's referred to as the Gutenberg Bible that ultimately became the King James and the Bibles that we have, uh, they, they settled on 66 books. And I don't think that number was determined based on the book of Isaiah. But we have the book of Isaiah with 66 chapters and you have the Bible with 66 books. You have the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, with 39 books, and you have 39 chapters before you get to Isaiah chapter 40. 40 to 66, you have 26 chapters, you have 26 books of the New Testament. It's as if Isaiah 40 to 66 is sort of the New Testament of the book of Isaiah. And why would that be relevant? It's relevant because in these chapters, in these 27 chapters, we see so many pictures of the people of the New Testament. That's who we are. And we appear over and over and over. In fact, we, we, are, we, are, we are pictured right at the beginning of chapter 40. So from the beginning of this section all the way to 66, you see these reoccurring pictures of the people of the New Testament, who we would say are Christians, although I don't particularly, particularly like the word Christian. Uh, it was a pejorative term when it was introduced, and to a certain extent, it still is. So, there is that mystery surrounding the book of Isaiah. I believe there's something to it. Uh, I, I, I can't prove it, but the evidence is clear when you, look at it, when you look at it in the perspective that I'm presenting it tonight. At any rate, let's move on and begin to, to, to look at the messages in Isaiah. So, we looked at Isaiah chapter 3. Excuse me. We looked, in, we looked at Isaiah, the third message, in Isaiah chapter 40, 44 and 48. It deals with idolatry. God is warning his people, Israel, about idolatry, the sin of idolatry. The fourth message that we see in this section of Isaiah is very important. And I'm going to spend a little, a little time here in Isaiah chapter chapter 52 and 53. I kind of skipped over this last time, and I shouldn't have. Uh, I want to spend some time here because it's dealing with the atonement. It's dealing with the cross, the atonement. And that lends itself to what I said earlier about, a moment ago, about Isaiah chapter 40 to 66. It's, it's sort of the New Testament of the book of Isaiah because it's reflecting not only the people of the New Testament, but it reflects very clearly the Messiah, Isaiah 52 and 53. And so perhaps we can just take a quick look at Isaiah chapter 52. So the, 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 ref, or the, the references that begins to put emphasis on the Messiah in 52 begins in chapter 52 verse 13. So I'm going to read 13 and 15. And then most of us, we're very familiar with Isaiah 53. We know it's referring to the, the suffering servant who, from our point of view, is clearly Messiah Jesus. So, Isaiah 50, 52, 13 is where, is where it begins. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up, greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people. So there's a reference here to Israel that, that's going to be compared to his servant, who is Messiah Jesus. So his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, for what he had not told, what, for, excuse me, for what had not been told them, they will see, and what have not been heard, they will understand. So it says there in verse 15 that thus my, thus he, he will servant, God's servant will sprinkle many nations. So what was that referring to? Sprinkling of many nations. Is that the blood that was shed by the scribe? That's what, that's what we, we would believe. They, you know, there's, there's a picture there of Joseph and his multicolored coat, right? 
Uh, what, what did the brothers of Joseph do with, with that coat? They sprinkled blood on it, and, and it, was to, it was to somehow deceive uh, Joseph. Now, what is, the, what is the reference there of a multicolored coat? Well, I want to say to you, Jesus, it says here that, that he will sprinkle many nations. And in that sense, Joseph is a picture of Messiah Jesus, right? We all know that. But, but we don't, we've never really looked at this picture clear, clear, clear enough. Jesus is the one who will sprinkle his blood on all the nations. So the multicolored coat there is symbolic of all the nations. And so you, 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 you need to stop and wonder why Joseph, Joseph's coat was a multicolored coat. Because he purchased for God a people from every kindred, tongue, and nation by his blood. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 4. Five, right? So, so to get a sense for what I'm talking about and how profound this reference really is, let's go to Isaiah chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read for you verse 9 and 5. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, right? Sprinkled. Just as it says in Isaiah chapter 52, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nations, and you have, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So that multicolored coat there, again, is symbolic of all the nations being sprinkled, covered by the blood of Jesus. And then it goes into chapter 53, and, and all of chapter 53 is, is really putting a strong emphasis on the suffering servant, the Lamb of God. I'm not sure if we read any of this. I don't think we did. For instance, in chapter 53, verse 4, 5, and 6, Surely our grief he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him to be stricken, smitten, and smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquity. The chastisement of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourgings, we are healed. By his stripes, the King James would say. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. The entire chapter uh, points to the reality of the suffering servant, the Lamb of God. And so that's a very important section here, uh, this, the, the fourth message of Isaiah, which, again, really has to do with the servant, the servant of God, who is Israel, and, of course, Jesus, Messiah Jesus, and the price that will be paid. All right, I think we can move on to the, to the fifth message, which is Isaiah chapter 56, and, and uh, verse 1 to 8 is what we're going to look at. It's actually 56.1 to chapter 56.8. The emphasis there of God's call upon a people. Again, who is that people? The people is, in fact, the church. All right? So let's, let's read in Isaiah chapter 56 now. This is one of those very important messages that we find in Isaiah. Now, what we're going to see here is going to challenge much of Christianity in the sense that it's going to put the very important emphasis of this people on the Shabbat, the importance of the Shabbat. All right, someone's buzzing. So, let's read. We're going to read 56, 1 to 5, and we may go a little further. Perhaps 1 to 8. All right, now thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning my Shabbat, my Sabbath, and keep his hands from doing evil. So a very declarative statement. How blessed is the man who keeps the Sabbath and, and, and refrains from doing evil. Let not the foreigner, okay, now this is where it begins to reflect who we are, let not, let not the, floor, the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Now, the foreigner who joins himself to Israel, let them not say that the Lord will separate us from his people. Who are his people? 
in this context, of course, his people is in fact Israel. Now the foreigner here seems to want to be joined to the people of Israel and their Sabbath observant. And then it goes on. Nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Now the word eunuch there is what we have to look at. There are a couple of words in Hebrew for eunuch, and the one that's used in Isaiah chapter 56 is the Hebrew word saris. The word saris can be used as a eunuch, but the word saris really means an official, a court official, someone who works in the court of a king, who's been given duty, responsibility in the king's court. That's what a saris is, a, 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 a prince in a sense He's given responsibility. He's given charge. He's a eunuch in the sense that he's devoted to the king. There's another word for eunuch that really involves uh, the process by which someone becomes a eunuch. And that's not the word that's used here. The word saris is used in every instance that we will see the word unique uh, eunuch here. I want to I I declare to you something very obvious, that the eunuchs are the same foreigners who have joined themselves to the Lord who are observing the Sabbaths. And who do we suppose the eunuchs would be? Who do you think? Is it an unreasonable position to maintain that believers in Messiah Jesus would in fact be the court officials in God's temple? Why would it be when Jesus himself said that? Yes, it's, it's declared in almost the same way in the New Testament. The, the 12 gates that we see in the New Jerusalem are for the apostles or for the church. Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 19 that those of you that overcome, you've, you've, you've heard me cite this before, I think we've read it before, uh, you will sit on 12 thrones and you will rule or judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Saris, servants in God's court, in God's temple. All right, let's read on. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuch who keeps my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. So to the eunuchs or the saris, the court officials, the ones who will be brought into God's courts from among the nations who will observe the Sabbaths, they will be given names better than sons and daughters. Who do you suppose the sons and daughters are referring to? Well, of course, Israel. In that context, it can only mean Israel. So names that are better or more, more valuable valuable is not even a good word, or more, more relevant, more important than sons and daughters. Now, it goes on, verse 6, we'll read 6 to, to, to 8. So b b before we go on, you see there that the Saris, or the, what's, with what we interpret or translate as eunuchs, can only mean disciples in Messiah Jesus. Obviously, because we are the ones who will function in God's temple, in his court, in his courtyard. Let's read. Also the foreigner who joins themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from profaning my Sabbath and hold fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offering and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. The Lord, the, the Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. So very clear, this chapter here, most of this chapter, 1 to 8, is relevant to who we are. And not just relevant to who we are, but also relevant to our function as it relates to the work in God's temple. But I want you to see here sort of a prerequisite to being a part of this or to being a, a eunuch, a saris, is 
observance of the Shabbat. God is consistent. He does not change. And from the very beginning, he honored, he honored the Sabbath. He rested on the Sabbath. And he commanded Israel to observe the Sabbath. There are people who would say that the church has no place or no responsibility, responsibility towards the Shabbat. There are people who say that, that we don't have a responsibility towards the Shabbat because we have the seven Noahide laws, which does not include the Sabbath. Well, I reject that offhand. The Sabbath is God's Sabbath, and if we're God's people, then the Sabbath is obviously relevant to us. Well, clearly here from Isaiah chapter 56, God believes that it is. He's stating that it is. And that it is our responsibility to observe the Sabbath, to celebrate the Sabbath. He puts a, a high premium on that, wouldn't you say? So those that are in his house, in his, in his temple, to serve him within close proximity, these are the Saris. And, and, it's, and it's a very clear picture, isn't it? Because in the ancient world, a king would appoint people that are closest to him, he would appoint eunuchs. And what is a eunuch? A eunuch is someone who is cut off from the world, and I, I don't, no pun intended, but he's cut off from the world, and he is given a position very, very close to the king, very trusted. The, the eunuch has no business or no even desire for anything that's beyond the realm of the king. He is the king's chief servant. Well, I, I think Christians ought to see themselves that way, because ultimately that's who we are. You see, and, and, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the, I guess I can say one of the pitfalls of, of, of being a Christian in today's world is that we don't necessarily think that we need that dimension of devotion to God. We don't need to be that devoted to God. And I, I don't believe that's true at all. I think God wants from us that same level of devotion where we're cut off from this world, we have nothing in this world, as Jesus said, and we're completely and fully rendered over to the service of God, the service in his kingdom. We're eunuchs. I have no problem saying I'm a eunuch or a saris. I'm a eunuch for God. I'm totally cut off. All right? So, so we have this incredible picture here that, that Isaiah gives us in Isaiah chapter 55 and 56. Now, the sixth message that we see in the book of Isaiah has to do with uh, judgment of the wicked. And there's some pretty graphic uh, references in, in this section right here, especially in uh, chapter 59. So maybe we can take a quick look over here in 59. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe not so much. But, but anyway, if, uh, the, these chapters here in the sixth message is dealing with with, with some important issues also, right squarely in the middle of that, we see the fast of God, God's fast. In Isaiah 56, 6 to 9, this is the fast, this is God's fast. This is the fast that God desires. So maybe we can read that. Isaiah chapter 58, we're going to read 6 to 9. So, let's take a look. Is this not the fast which I choose, he says, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with, with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from, from your own flesh, from your own, you know, your own kin people, your own people. Don't hide yourself from your own people. Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will be speedily spring will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry, and He will say, "Here am I." If you, re, if you remove the yoke from your midst and pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. So God is, this is the fast God requires. Uh, Israel would fast before God and as, as a result of fasting, they would, they would expect God's reaction. And the fast would be mainly to, to refrain from food or to refrain from drink or whatever it is they can refrain from. 
And God effectively, he, he, he issues a rebuke and he basically says, that's not really the fast that I'm looking for. I'm looking for a fast of righteousness where you're breaking the yoke of wickedness. And if you do, if you, if you, if you do the things that pleases me in regards to the fast, then you will receive the blessing that you seek. You see, and sometimes it's, 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 uh, it's our way, even as Christians, to fast in that way. We, we're going to refrain from food until we, get, until we get God's attention. I'm going to stay off of Facebook for 40 days so that I would show God how devoted I want to be to him. Whatever it is we choose to fast from. And there is something to that, of course. But the fa again, the fast, according to this, that God wants is the fast that involves our righteousness, our, our righteous conduct. And if we do it, we will, we will get that blessing that we are all in search of. Now, the seventh message here in this portion of Isaiah has to do with God's restoration of Israel, Zion. Uh, same thing. Let's go to, to, to a very iconic chapter in, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. And who would like to do some, I'm going to read, let's see, I'm going to read uh, 1 to 3. Who would like to read 4 to 9 for us? Anyone? Let me read 1 to 3. So this, this portion here in Isaiah is definitely a restorationist process, uh, portion. God is preparing to restore Israel. He's going to glorify Zion. And I'm hoping that you guys are already color-coded in your Bible. I see one, a couple of you have your, your, um, your highlighters. Well, this portion here has to do with both the restoration of Israel and the glorification of Zion. It begins in Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory, of the, Lord, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will walk by your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. So clearly here God is referring to uh, his people Israel. He, he's speaking to his people Israel, and he's talking about a time when he will return his favor to Israel. The light will shine in the midst of Israel. Darkness will encompass the entire earth. Now, ov obvious question is, do we not see the great darkness that has begun to encompass the world? You would say, but wait a minute, that's been happening forever, right? Certainly that's true. There's always been darkness since the fall of man. Since the destruction of Babel going forward, there's always been an uh, element of darkness uh, seeking to span throughout the world. But what we're seeing today is a dimension of darkness that, that surpasses what we saw during the time of Nimrod and the Sumerian kingdom, uh, Babel. Because the darkness has a potential now to spread way beyond Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, as it was with Nimrod's Babel. Effectively, during Nimrod's Babel, you had Mesopotamia, you had the Fertile Crescent, and that's where all of civilization had, had settled. Now, today, we have civilization spread throughout the world, and this darkness is beginning to cover the entire world. In Prophets 3, we're going to look at the book of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel sees a beast unlike anything he's ever seen before. It is the fourth beast of Daniel, chapter 7. And he, he was perplexed about this fourth beast. It was awesome, unlike anything he's ever seen before. And he sought interpretation, understanding of what this fourth beast was. The angel that was speaking with Daniel said to him, this fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will come upon the earth and it will crush and subdue the entire world. And so he's obviously talking about a world system, a world order, a world government. This is that darkness that's going to cover the entire world. And we're already seeing it. It's only been, what, 70 years or so since the formation of the United Nations. You know, legitimately, uh, the United Nations formed 70 years ago. Or maybe it was 72 years ago, I'm not sure. But somewhere there... They came into existence. 1947, I think, is when the UN was constituted. Uh, and, and, and at that time, they, they put in place 
the framework for a government system, a governmental system that will ultimately uh, cover the entire world, uh, become a world government. This was part of their manifesto in 1947. They effectively said that we're putting together a government that's going to ultimately span throughout the world. It will become truly a world government. And that what we put in place, in, what, what they have put in place in 1947 was just a prototype of what is to come. Now, they, they presented the, the, the grand illusion of a world government in a very benevolent light. Uh, that, that this government is exactly what humanity needs. Uh, without this government, humanity will not survive. And that's what they began to propagate 72 years ago. Now, obviously, some of us, we clearly understand that that's not true, that that government will not be benevolent and that it would invariably be malevolent. It will eventually be despotic and destructive. Any government that's set up on the, uh, that's, that's, that is set up on this planet, where man has control of the governance of it, it will turn to evil. Any government. Because the United Nations seeks no authority uh, from God. It's a, it is its own source of authority. A government like that will only do evil. It is Babel. It is Babylon of the book of Revelation. And that's the darkness that Isaiah saw. But what did he say? Arise and shine. Your time to shine has come. A gross darkness covers the nations. Your time to shine has come. Now in that word, there is an, there is an admonishment. And the admonishment is to shine. To shine. God's going to call his people to arise and to shine. Now, you say, I say for sure that's, rele that's relevant to Israel, but it's all also relevant to us, those of us in Messiah Jesus, because we are God's people as well. We're grafted into God's natural people, Israel, and we are, we are God's people as well. So our time to shine has come. We ought to arise in the midst of this darkness and shine. A quick question is, how do we... Practically speaking, how do we shine in this time? Jesus said that we were a light, we were the light of the world, right? That's what he said in Matthew chapter 5. In John chapter 7 he ref or 8, he referred to himself as the light of the world. But then in Matthew's gospel, he said to us, you are the light of the world. He said, let your light so shine that men would glorify your Father that's in heaven. Well, I believe it's, it's definitely connected to Isaiah chapter, four, chapter 60, 1 to 3. Because our time to shine has come. We, we live in a time of gross darkness. What happens when nighttime falls upon us, when it's night? During the day, there, there's light, and it's very difficult to shine during the day because we have light. And what happens when it becomes dark? It becomes easier to shine. Our time to shine comes. And I think, I think here the prophet is speaking to Israel and us and effectively exhorting us to arise and shine. How do we do it? What causes us to shine? To be a light. Being obedient to God, yes. One thing about light is it shuns darkness. It drives darkness away, right? It overtakes darkness, absolutely. Light is truth. Light is truth. That's, that's, that's what light is. I am the light and the truth. He is the truth. He is the light. When we commit ourselves to speak the truth and to do it uncompromisingly, in the face of any danger, when we, when we take a stand against this darkness, regardless of how encompassing the darkness may seem, and we say, I'm not going to succumb to this darkness. I'm going to stand and I'm going to speak the truth. Uh, whatever the cost is, I am going to proclaim the truth. You, you are becoming a light. Because light comes as a result of truth. And so when we stand for the truth, when we, when we are uncompromising about God's word, about his truth, we become a light. And there are many pressures today in this darkness that, that compels us to not speak the truth, such as speaking out against homosexuality. 
speaking out against the spread of Islam, speaking out, speaking out against the horror of, of modern Christianity. You don't speak out against those things. You don't speak out against uh, a world order at the same time. You don't do it if you don't want the pressure that comes from doing it. But if you're, if you're unafraid and unabashed, then you will speak the truth and you'll be a light. That's how you're a light. You see, the early disciples, they were all lights, bright shining lights, because they were speaking out against the evil of that time. And so our time to shine is now. Israel's time to shine is now as well, and that would make sense. Now, verse 4 to 9 now deals with the restoration of Israel. Who would like to read a few verses for us? Verse 4 to 9, anyone? the restoration aspect continues who are these who fly like a cloud and many of us we think it's referring to jet planes and like the dove to their lattice surely the coastland will wait for me and the ships of Tarshish will come first and bring your sons from afar their silver and their gold with them for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you so all of these verses is referring to the restoration of Israel and simultaneously the glorification of Zion. Now, verse 10 to 14 begins to re-emphasize on the people who would be of the nations that will seek to join themselves to Israel. And let's read, I'm going to read 10 to 14. Foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, referring to Israel. God certainly did. And in my favor, I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night, so that man may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. So Isaiah here has seen a time when Israel would receive a tremendous favor from the nations, and the people of the nations will seek to join themselves to the people of Israel. All of it is in the context of restoration and glorification of Zion, isn't it? For the nations and the kingdoms which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper and the box tree and the cypress together the beautif uh, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. Wonderful. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing down to you. And all those who despise you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet. And they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Again, restoration of Israel and the glorification of Zion. But consistent in what we've read here from Isaiah 60 is that God will bring a people from the nations to a place of submission to Israel. Now we may not like the way that sounds, but it's absolutely biblical. It's not only Isaiah referred to it, the other prophets also referred to it as well. A people, the people of the nations, will come in a posture of submission to the people of Israel. Now what does it say here? Verse, verse 12, one more time. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you, Israel, will in fact perish. 
Now that's, that's wonderful. From my point of view, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And so the rest of the chapter does go on like this, referring to that period when God will restore Israel, glorify Zion, and bring the nations to a place of submission to Israel. Now, I want to tell you this before we go any further, and, we, and I create some confusion. We are not included in the nations at this time. When the restoration of Israel occurs, when God glorifies Zion, and he is dwelling in the midst of Zion, we are no longer people of the nations. We were formerly Gentiles, according to what Peter said. We were formerly, or, or Paul, we were formerly people of the nations, but now we've become the people of God. And isn't that what Paul said, confirmed by Peter and others? So at this point, we are former Gentiles, formerly people of the nations, but then had been joined to God through Messiah Jesus. So clearly, we are reigning with him in Zion. We are a part of the glory that God has placed in the midst of Zion at this point. Yes, sir? Uh, at what point did this occur? Okay. So you can, you can identify a timeline here, all right? Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, begins the period of time when darkness will cover the entire world. I am, I am putting that time period right about where we are right now. And so it develops. God then moves, and then, then nations are joining themselves to Israel. And ultimately, he's referring to the time when God will reign in the earth through Messiah Jesus. So contained in this timeline of a chapter is the coming of Messiah Jesus, the establishment of the kingdom, the reign of the church with Jesus in the earth. Israel is glorified. Israel is lifted up as a nation. And the nations are in perfect submission to Israel. Yes, the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Yes. Oh, but we're seeing it. We're seeing the beginning of it. I mean, if you, have, if you have a biblical, well, if you have a prophetic insight or a prophetic view of, of where we are today in terms of, of, of our, our, our prophecy, where we are relevant to prophecy, you can begin to see the fulfillment of this. Israel being, exalted, being lifted up as a nation before God. And the, and the nations now are beginning to come to that place. They're resisting. But people of the nations are beginning to look to Israel. It's happening. So it's, it's pointing clearly to the reality that we're approaching this incredible time that the prophet referred to in Isaiah chapter 60. Can you see it? It's, it's very clear. All right. Now, the next message here is the eighth message. And so let's, let's take a look at this. In Isaiah chapter 61... Isaiah 61, uh, God refers to, uh, well, clearly here in 61, we see a reference here that clearly pertains to Jesus. Um, and Jesus himself cited Isaiah 61 when he read in that Torah portion in the synagogue in, in Nazareth. All right, so let's read. Isaiah 61, a clear reference to Messiah Jesus and also those in Messiah Jesus. Isaiah 61, I'm going to read 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to, to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to whom all will mourn. To grant, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a gallon, of, uh, a gallon instead of ashes, an oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting. So they will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And that's, a, that's, of course, an iconic reference. Jesus read only verse 1 in the synagogue, and he closed the book. And so clearly he's making a statement that this chapter, this reference here, is pertinent to me. I've come, he's anointed, he's come for that purpose. This also relates to what we read two weeks ago in Isaiah chapter 40. The God's, God's servant, 
who will come to pursue justice, justice among the nations. And he's also here to proclaim the day of the vengeance of our God. All right. Also now, let's move forward in Isaiah chapter 62. What time is it? Isaiah chapter 62, 6 to 9, we see here um, judgment. Judgment, but we need to read this. Let's read it. Isaiah chapter 62, 6 to 9. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. Uh, you who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give, you gain, uh, give your, gain as f your grain excuse me, as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored, but those who, who, garner, who, excuse me, those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. So he's referring to a time when Israel will no longer be under the yoke of the nations. The nations will certainly be in a place of judgment at this time. Isaiah 63 is where we begin to see a really clear picture of God's judgment upon the nations. Uh, chapter four, uh, 62, 10 to 12 is, all, is also relevant to the restoration of Israel to the glorification of Zion. Let's read it. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highways, remove the stones, lift up the standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people. Who will call who will call them the holy people? The nations will call the people of Israel the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So you've heard me say before that the people of Zion and Zion are synonymous, that Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem are the same. I always, I always see the people of Israel synonymously with Zion because it appears that way in many texts in the prophets. And this is one of those texts where the people of Israel are synonymous with Zion. It, that what we see there in verse 12 clearly points to that, that fact. Now, Isaiah chapter 63 now gets a little graphic in terms of God's judgment. Let's read Isaiah 63, 1 to 6. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of flowing colors from Buzra? This one, this one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. So who is this one? Who do we suppose this one is? We would, we would believe that, right? I think mostly, mostly everyone will agree that this is Jesus. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like the one who treads in the winepress. Where else do we see a reference to the winepress or the treading of the winepress? Revelation chapter 19. Jesus is the one who has been given to, th to thread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 19. It makes a mention of this this threading of the wine press, other places in the Bible. But here we're seeing very clearly that this one, this great one, marching in the greatness of his strength, is going to press the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Now, there's a reference that we see in Isaiah chapter 49 that's relevant to Judah when, when uh, Israel or Yaakov prophesied over Judah. And let's go to, before we go further in this, let's go to, uh, to Genesis chapter 49. Again, this is the prophecy that was spoken over Judah when Yahakov or Israel was about to die. 49 verse 11. We 
we know that 49, 8 to 12 is a clear reference, it's a clear messianic reference actually. It's referring to, to, to the one who will come from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah figure. In fact, maybe we should read, yes, let's read 8 to 12, why not? Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp, a young lion, in other words, a, a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares to rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now that's a clear and concise messianic reference. The scepter there meaning it's, it's, there's going to be a king that's going to come from Judah. And that scepter, that rule will not depart from his hands, from between his feet, until Shiloh or Shiloh comes. And so there's a lot of consideration as to what Shiloh is. And it says here at the end of verse 10, and to him shall the obedience of the people. In other words, to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, in verse 10, him there should be capitalized because, and I'm not sure why people have missed this, this is referring to the time when Jesus will hand the scepter over to God. And we, we see that in, in uh, very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said it, that Jesus will rule, he's been given all authority to rule, but in the end, he will hand everything over to God. He'll hand the scepter back, to, back over to God. Shiloh here is always a reference of God's dwelling place. The word Shiloh references where God will dwell. Now, the word Shiloh appears for the first time in this text. So Yaakov or Israel used the word Shilu, and what does the word Shilu actually mean? It has no real significant meaning. It's probably an Aramaic word, an archaic, archaic Aramaic word, but when Israel came into the land of Israel, the first place that they put the tabernacle, they named Shilu, meaning that this is God's dwelling. So from their point of view, Shilu simply meant when or where God would dwell. Well, clearly, we know, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, that God will dwell in the midst of his creation again. That is Shilu. In other words, the new creation is Shilu. And the one who will reign, the scepter will not depart from his, from, from his hands, from between his feet, until the new creation comes. That's when Jesus hands over everything to God. That's when he gives a scepter to God. All right? And so clearly that's a profound messianic reference right there. Absolutely. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey colt to the choice vine. He washes his garment in wine. Now, now we're beginning to relate to the wine, the wine press, thread in the wine press, God's judgment. He washes his garment in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes, his eyes are dull with wine and his teeth white from milk. Those references there, even though obscure, it's referring to the, the, the purpose of the Messiah when it comes to judgment. You see, and, and this is something that sometimes we shy away from. We shy away from it because we don't want to think of Jesus typically as a, as a conquering lion the Lion of Judah. We don't want to think of him that way. We much prefer to think of him in, in the Isaiah chapter 52, 53 form, the suffering servant. We much prefer to look at him from that point of view. But the truth is, he did come to be the Lamb. He did come to be that suffering servant. But when he returns, he's not the suffering servant. He is the conquering Lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's coming to bring judgment. He's coming to correct everything that's wrong in humanity, and put an end to Satan's rule. He's coming to press the wine press. And that's what Isaiah is referring to here in Isaiah chapter 63. So let's read. Uh, trample, uh, verse 3, we read that. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. God says the day of my judgment, the day of vengeance, 
is in my heart. And, and my year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help. And I was astonished and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me and my wrath upheld me. His own, who, who represents God's own arm? Jesus. He is the right, he's at the right hand of God. So the picture there is you have God, the Father, who sits on the throne, and at his right hand is his son. He is the right arm. He is the arm of God. Right? Uh, Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I make my enemies a footstool for you. The Lord says, rule in the midst of my enemy. I often refer to that psalm as the war psalm. And for good reason, because it's about that. Let's go back and look at that psalm in Psalm 110. This is very relevant to the reality of the function of Messiah Jesus when he does in fact return. I call this a war psalm and we're going to read all of it and you'll understand why. The Lord says to my Lord, the word there for Lord when we see it the first time is Yehovah. The word Lord when we see it the second time is Adonai. So Yehovah said to Adonai, who do we think Adonai is? Well, Jesus himself said that he was. When he challenged the Pharisees, he says, how is it that David in the spirit says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Clearly identifying himself as Adonai in this case. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your, your strong scepter from Zion saying, there's a reference to the scepter again, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the, womb, from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as do. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now wait a minute. God here is referring to, to his placement of Jesus to be his right hand to be his right arm, and that he's going to give Jesus authority over his enemies. And it's a war psalm. Now, why all of a sudden we have a reference to a priesthood, the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. And we know that Jesus is the high priest according to that order, the order of Melchizedek, right? The writer of the book of Hebrews said this. So why is this reference in here? Because the subsequent verses is all about war. It's all about judgment. What does the priesthood have to do with judgment? God's judgment. Jesus the high priest. Later on we'll see in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, that the office of king and priest is the office of Messiah. A king is one who rules. The priest is the one who serves the people on behalf of God. So we're dealing with a royal priest who will engage in battle. And now that doesn't fit our typical Christian paradigm, does it? It doesn't really sit well with our standard thinking of who Jesus is. It doesn't. But this is a real clear and concise picture of who Jesus is. In fact, this is the Jesus that we need today. Won't you say? It is this Jesus that we are desperately needing in the world today. So let's read 5 to 7 of the same chapter, uh, Psalm 110. The Lord is at your right hand. He will, he will shatter kings in the day of, of his wrath. He will judge the nations, among the nations, excuse me, and he will fill them with corpses. And he will shatter the chief men over the broad country, and he will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. I, I, love, I love that, verse 7. <laughs> what is verse 7 saying? What is, the, what, is the, what is the essence of verse 7? He will drink from the brook by the wayside, therefore he will lift up his head. So in the midst of judgment, <laughs> Jesus commissioned by God to bring correction to God's creation. Uh, incredible task. Jesus is appointed for that purpose. He is the Lion of Judah, equipped for it. All authority is given unto him, and he's executing God's vengeance. That's what it says. He's doing it. But then all of a sudden, 
He will, drink by the, he will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Remember the, remember the story of Gideon and his men, how they went down to the brook and they drank from the brook and they lifted up their heads as they drank. The ones who were found worthy of the battle were the ones who drank and lifted up their heads. You see, this, this is speaking of the vigilance of Messiah Jesus and those in Messiah Jesus as well. So when this time of judgment comes, Jesus will be at peace, at peace. <laughs> he will bring judgment, but he himself will be at peace. That's why verse 7 begins by saying, he will drink from the brook by the wayside. In other words, he will, he will take a pause from his, from his process of judgment to drink from the brook, but he'll be vigilant as he does. I love that. It speaks of the confidence of who Jesus is and what he's appointed to do. He's appointed for judgment. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter, chapter 63. Again, this picture of Jesus, Yeshua, being that instrument of God's judgment is, is not very clear in much of Christianity. Again, why? Because we, we tend to want to avoid that picture. And I'm not sure why, because again, like I said just now, it is so much what we need today. It is absolutely what we need. I looked and there was no one to help. I was astonished that there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, his own right arm, as I said, and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the people in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath. And I will pour out their lifeblood on the earth. Wow. Ow. Owie. And just, just so that you don't think that this is the God of the Old Testament, and that's why it's so vivid and so, so graphic, let's go to Revelation chapter 19. I just love to read these verses because even though they're very graphic and they paint this other picture of Jesus, they are actually glorious verses because they're pointing to God's correction of humanity's evil. And you gotta agree with me that humanity is getting out of control. We are, we're getting out of control. Uh, we live in a very strange world today, a world that could not possibly have been imagined 50 years ago. 50 years ago, the great generation would have, would have lost their minds thinking that this generation would be where it is today. You think that's true? They would have not imagined that such a generation could exist. The abortions, the murders, the crimes against God. God's going to bring judgment, and when he does, it's going to be glorious from the perspective of God's view. From his view, it's going to be glorious because he's putting an end to sin. He's putting an end to man's chaos and man's mayhem. So, Revelation chapter 19. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed and holy are the, excuse me, am I? Yeah, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I felt, no, let's, let's pick it up from 11, 11 to 16, more relevant. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he wages war, he judges, excuse me, and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe, robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is Jesus. Now, when we get into Prophets 3, we're going to look at the different interpretations or ways by which you interpret the book of Revelation. One of the travesties in Christian treatment of the book of Revelation 
is that they, 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 have, they have these systems of interpreting the book of Revelation that says that the book of Revelation isn't really literal. It isn't something, it's all allegorical, metaphoric. It's not something that we can ever expect to happen. Now, why do you think, first of all, this, this began in early, early Christian history, but why do you think that treatment of the book of Revelation became necessary? Where they would look at verses like this and they would say, no, it's all allegorical, it's not literal. Why would they, why would they come to such conclusions? Because they are refusing to recognize Jesus in this light. The one who will break the seals that will bring God's judgment. The ones who will send the seven angels to, to, to sound the seven trumpets. They are refusing to see Jesus in that light. It's not a positive light from their point of view. But it is Jesus of the Bible. And this will be literally fulfilled. In other words, Jesus will literally break the eastern sky. He will come in the glory of God. And all of us will come with him. And he will come to press the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 63 is so relevant to who Jesus is as God's right arm, the one who will bring judgment on behalf of God. Listen, the Bible is clear, and I think it's absolutely true. It's not God's will that anyone should perish, right? We know that verse. It's true. God didn't take pleasure in destroying Egypt. He didn't take pleasure in any of that. Now God's enemies has turned against him and turned against his people. Even though God will not take pleasure in the destruction of life, he will in fact glory in the destruction of his enemies. Because when God destroys his enemies, he's actually preserving life. He's preparing so that life will thrive. That's what, that's what God's judgment will do. When God brings this awesome judgment that he's preparing through, through Messiah Jesus, he's actually ensuring, he's ensuring that there would be life. Rev, uh, Matthew chapter 24. The great tribulation that will come upon the earth. Jesus said, unless these days are shortened, no life will be spared. Now the tribulation that's coming, it's partially going to be as a result of man's sin. In fact, all of it is as a result of man's sin. And God's going to intervene in order that life will be preserved. So we have to change our perspective as it relates to judgment or the way we perceive God's judgment. We have to change our perspective and not see it as this horrible, despotic Old Testament God that's coming to beat up on everyone. That's an entirely wrong point of view. We must see it in proper context. He's a loving God who's coming to put an end to destruction so that life might be preserved. That's the correct way of looking at judgment. All right, so that's Isaiah chapter 63. Now, the subsequent verses in 63, uh, the, the prophet is calling for mercy. Then that brings us to Isaiah chapter 65, and I'm right on time, I believe. Isaiah 65 now we begin to see, in fact, the very first time we see a very clear, vivid picture of the new creation, what's referred to as the new creation, is in Isaiah chapter 65. It's found nowhere else in the Tanakh, not to this extent. Now, there's a reason why, from my point of view, there's a reason why it's at the very end of the book of Isaiah. All right, so remember the mystery of the book of Isaiah, right? You have 66 books, 66 chapters. You have, four, you have 39 chapters, Old Testament, 39 books up to Isaiah. Then chapter 40 to 66, you have 27 books. And the last book of the New Testament, of course, is the book of Revelation. The end of the book of Revelation is about the new heaven and the new earth. Or the preparation for it. From, from Revelation chapter 19, we're actually... Revelation chapter 13 all the way to 22 is about the final, the, 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 the new creation. Because 18 to 19, excuse me, 13 to 19 of the book of Revelation is pointing to that great conflict that will ultimately bring about the millennial kingdom 
at the end of the millennial kingdom comes the new heaven, the new earth, the new creation. So it's no surprise then that in Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, we see the new creation. For the first time, you see there's a clear uh, coupling, I should say, between Isaiah chapters 40 to 66 and the New Testament in that regard. So it's, we see it here for the first time in Isaiah chapter 65. I'm going to read 17 and 18. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. The Jerusalem that's being referred to there is the new Jerusalem. What we in Christianity would refer to as heaven. Heaven. This is, this is what the prophet, the prophet Isaiah began to relate. This is what God showed him. God showed him a picture, I guess, of that new creation. And then in the, in the following chapter, he makes another reference to it in verse 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, uh, which, which I, I make will endure forever, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. So a second reference there to the new creation. Again, at the end of the New Testament, the last two chapters, in fact, more specifically, the last three chapters, 20 to 22, is the clearest reference we, we have of a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth, correlating with what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 66 and 65 and 66. All right, so to that point, I think we can, we can move on. What we want to do for the rest of the class tonight is, as, is cover as many study guides as we possibly can. So in regards to covering the book of Isaiah, we did, we did sort of a rough coverage of the book of Isaiah. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the prophet here is making a comparison to the experience that we have now, our life experience now and then. Obviously, in the new creation, there will be no death. That's what we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, chapter 21. Clearly, in the new creation, there will be no death. There, he said it, there will be no death and no sickness. So it's sort of like what we see in uh, Zechariah, chapter, chapter 12. It says that the house of David would be like God, that the, the, the most humble in the house of David would be like King David. So it's sort of a comparison. comparison. It's just an, to, 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 to display that new form. I don't believe anyone During the Millennial Kingdom, not us, of course. In the Millennial Kingdom, we'll inherit a new creation form. We will reign in that new creation. Form. It says it there quite clearly in Revelation chapter uh, 20 that those who resurrect will not be part of the second death, which is the lake of fire. We cannot experience death again. But the people, the nations, the people who will live during the millennial kingdom, they will experience life and death, birth and, and death. Perhaps they would live better lives, stronger lives, and maybe live to be to, to be older, uh, perhaps in that, in that state there will be a different, uh, different environment, perhaps even. I think there would be because Jesus is reigning in the earth and reigning alongside him or with him is the church and we will have our, our complete scope of function in the earth. So people may live, as it says, their people may live for extended periods of time, but yet they will live and die. Clearly they would live and die because at the end of the millennial kingdom, 
an army comes up against Jerusalem to bring judgment against God's people and God will destroy the army. That's when he destroys the entire world with fire. Peter in 2 Peter spoke about that judgment, the final judgment, when God will destroy the earth with fire. All the elements, Peter said, will burn up. And that's because God is preparing a new heaven and a new earth. But this, this particular existence, this particular earth and heaven will exist throughout from now until the end of the millennial reign. We'll have this, this very same creation. All of this will come to an end according to our belief system. And God will make something completely new, something completely different. And, and what he will make is probably something way beyond our imagination. It says that there he will make a new heaven and a new earth. Old things have, have been done away with. New things come into existence. So we can, we can with that, we can speculate. Uh, and speculate in a subjective, but we can speculate in regards to what that creation might be like. So as it stands right now, from what we know, we exist on a pretty insignificant planet. We do. In terms of size, in terms of position in this Milky Way galaxy that we, we seem to know everything about, uh, we exist on a pretty insignificant rock. Third from a very small sun, relatively small sun. With the, with the advent of Hubble and, and other technologies, we've discovered that our sun is minute compared to other suns out there, other stars. They're stars that will dwarf, apparently, our sun a, a, a thousand times over, easily. So our planet is very, very seemingly very insignificant. We have, we, have, we have this life on our planet. We don't know if, if other planets can, can, can contain life or does, in fact, contain life. I think it's possible, but not life like it is on this planet. Because I believe that God, in his infinite wisdom, chose to establish life in his image and likeness right here on this planet. Seemingly insignificant planet. Now, I'm not going to be too dogmatic about it, but I would also say that, that it's quite possible that life, in fact, I'm pretty sure that life exists outside of this planet, outside of this solar system. I'm pretty sure of it. But not life in God's image and likeness, where he has created humans. To the, we actually, our creation is as such that we, we are created to rule over God's creation. So, now, the, the solar system, our solar system is just one little star with some planets circulating it, and we're part of a gigantic swirl of planets, of clusters of stars. The Milky Way, it's a, it's a swirl. So, we are part of a, of a, of a colossal swirl of planetary bodies and stars. But, but from what they are beginning to discover, our galaxy is really an insignificant galaxy compared to some of the other galaxies that are being observed. And so what they're beginning to toy with, and all of this is speculation, of course. You know, we humans, we tend to have all the answers. Uh, what, what's being speculated right now that the universe itself is in fact a swirl of galaxies. So it's a swirl within a swirl within a swirl. And that's just speculation, but who knows? So if you think about the, the enormity of that, what creation is. So consider that this room here might represent the known universe. You can't put boundaries on the universe, but let's say this room here represents the universe. You have, you have floating around in this universe, in this room, Little, little, let's say, objects about the size of a BB. Each one of those represent a galaxy. And there are millions upon billions of galaxies, and they're all in this universe swirling. The galaxies themselves are swirling. So are the planets around its stars. That's what they're toying with right now. And that's, that's way out there. It's way, way out there. So, how insignificant is this, is this planet where God has chosen to establish life in his image and likeness? He created all of it. He created this world, if there is such a thing. God said, he stuck his finger into the universe, and he said, I'm going to create a swirl. 
life. Just, just life everywhere. You can't say there's no life in the universe. Look out there at night. There's life. Abundant life. It's everywhere. It's represented in light. Organic life. Animated life. I don't know. I would say so for sure, perhaps. But the new creation now. What's going to happen? Behold, I make all things new. A new heaven and new earth. Perhaps he's going to stop the swirl. And he'll create one massive, one massive existence of planet life. <laughs> and perhaps then he will make planet earth what will be earth the most conspicuous the largest the zenith of all the planets of the universe we don't know it's speculation you see so so it's possible that in this new creation this new heaven and this new earth earth becomes the centerpiece of this new universe this new creation and squarely on this new earth, in this new creation, he will plant his temple. 1,500 miles cube, squarely on this new earth, in this new swirl, in this new creation. So, if, if, if you would, just entertain that for a moment. And in this new creation, the beings who are created in his image and likeness will be given governance over all of it. We were created for that purpose to begin with, perhaps. All of this speculation, but it's good speculation. I like it. So, new heavens, new earth. We don't know what that's entailed or what that will look like, but it's going to be glorious. All things are done. All things are done away with. And quite frankly, they need to be done away with. What do you think? We've made a mess of God's creation. He's going to fix it. So, yes. us to experience death once we are resurrected in that form the fire will not destroy us right, so. oh so th okay so think about this the end of Revelation chapter 20 God sits on the great white throne everything is consumed in fact that's what it says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 and 11 everything is burnt up of course, not us, because we're with him. We're ruling with him. And he brings all the nations resurrected before him. Some are judged to the lake of fire. Some are judged to the new creation. So already he's destroyed everything. And at that point, the new creation is at the threshold. He, he renders judgment. He would cast those who have not been found worthy into the lake of fire. And everyone else inherits that new existence. That new heaven and new earth. But for us, we're already there. In fact, during the millennial kingdom, we are a representation of the new creation. We represent the new creation in our physical form. All right, so let's take a break. We'll come back at 20 after 9, and we'll try and get some study guides done. Lots of speculation there, some of it wild speculation, but I think it's good. <laughs> Migrants, Muslim migrants, uh, marched in the airport in Paris. That wonderful airport, that oh, so incredible airport. Good to stay away from. But Kevin is over there, so. <laughs> so. Uh, I, went to, I, I went to, I stopped in Paris two years ago. What a mess that place is. Just incredible. I hated the airport. It's terrible. The the uh, the native Parisians were horrible. They were horrible, and then you had the 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 migrants. Uh, oh, terrible! I don't want to go back to to France ever again. You know, under France, under the city Paris, I should say, there are catacombs. Uh, miles and miles and miles of catacombs where at least five million people were killed during the history of Paris. Uh, 
Paris has a sordid history. The Romans went up there and they made a mess of the ghouls that they met, the Celts that they met up there in Paris. Anyway, so let's, let's, uh, let's look at some study guides tonight. See how many study guides we can get done. So study guide one, your page 24, I believe it is. We're looking at the, the whole story of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 to 5. From your list of the kings of Judah, approximately what time frame did Isaiah preach? Correct. Somewhere between 8 to 700 BC was during the reign of Hezekiah Uzziah. All right, what were the overt signs of repentance that Isaiah called Judah to? It's really all of Israel because Isaiah began to prophesy during the time of, of, the, of the divided kingdom. Israel was still there, but some of his messages were directed towards Israel and some of them again towards Judah. So what were the overt signs of repentance that Isaiah called Judah to, or all of Israel? To reprove the ruthless, he said, defend the orphan, the orphan, plead for the widow. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17. To, to conduct righteousness, to act righteously. The hope that Isaiah set before the Jewish people was that ultimately the law would go forth from and the word of God from Jerusalem. Right. That's of course an iconic verse. Certainly relevant to Israel during the millennial kingdom and uh, leading up to it for sure. Some of the signs that the men of Judah included. But they, did the eastern ladies, the soothsayers, idol worship of them, you name it, they yeah. did it. Right, and they engaged in evil commerce as well. Some of the sins, signs, some of the sins of the women of Judah included. Wanton eyes is what you're looking for. Yeah. Pride and sed seduction, yes, certainly they had a little bit of an issue with that. Uh, we sold, the women sold some jewelry yesterday, and uh, I'm not going to go any further than that. <laughs> no, but they, uh, they were involved in overt seduction. Um, No, not here. No, 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 no. I want to stay out of trouble as best as I can. Isaiah uh, foresaw God's dwelling in Jerusalem and manifested in what way? Cloud by day and fire by night. All right. Correct. That's good. Section two. Where did Isaiah see the Lord? In his temple, right. It appears as if God didn't want Judah to repent and live. What is the explanation for this? Yet God's purpose will be accomplished in the earth and no flesh will glory. I can't answer the question. <laughs> so in the same chapter, chapter 6, it seems as if God wanted Israel to remain hardened, wanted Israel to remain in a place of not knowing. So that's always a sort of a theological challenge right there. So, so we can't do much with it, but it's simply, simply just to take it for what it says. Section 2. Where did Isaiah see the Lord? We said that. We read that uh, in, in his temple. Uh, section 3. The conflict pictured here is between what parties? In Isaiah chapter 7. It's with the Assyrians, actually the people of Syria, the Arameans, and Israel. And they, they joined forces against Judah. This was during the time of King Asa. Well, no, it was during the time of King Hezekiah, just, just before Hezekiah's king, kingship. What did Isaiah name his son? Swift is the booty, 
Speedy is the prey. Someone read that for us. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. over to judgment. Be given over to judgment. All right. On whose throne would the promised king sit? In chapter 9, verse 7, I am looking at uh, section 3, uh, C. The throne of King David. What instrument will God use to judge Damascus and Samaria? Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 10, said that God would raise up the Assyrians to bring judgment against the evil alliance between Syria and, and uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. That alliance was becoming a bit too comfortable, and ultimately there would have been a, simul a simulation between Syria and the northern kingdom. God determined that he would put an end to that alliance, and he raised up and a common enemy who were the Assyrians, the people of Nineveh. And they brought judgment against the alliance. Hope will come through the stem of Jesse. That's the first time, or the second time actually, we see the word branch used, but it's not Zemach. In that context, it is Natsur or Natsur, which is a Hebrew word for branch. In chapter 4 of Isaiah, the word the Zemach is used, and Zemach really isn't branch, it's an offshoot. But ultimately, the offshoot can become a branch. So the offshoot, the Zemach, can become a Natsur. In Isaiah chapter 11, the word Natsur is used in that context, and it's directly related to Jesse, or King David, the father of King David. All right, and uh, Isaiah speaks of the restoration of nature. What are some of the signs of the restoration, of this restoration? The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the kid. The cow and the bear will graze together. The lion will eat straw. So something quite revolutionary has happened to creation at this point. This is, we believe, would be referring to, uh, you know, the utopia of the millennial kingdom. When the lion would eat straw, even though currently the lion isn't designed to eat straw, they have uh, canine teeth, I guess you can say, that are designed to puncture and rip and devour. But they will go to straw. The, the entire constitution is designed to eat meat and lots of it. In this creation, they will eat straw. Now that's, that's, a, that's as they say, an eye-opener in and of itself. But this is what Isaiah sees. Section 4, uh, Babylon, now we're in, we're in that part of Isaiah that deals with the judgment of the nations. What nation did Isaiah see that, that would come against Babylon? He named it, the Medes. He didn't say the Persians, but later on, he will refer to a Persian king by the name of Cyrus. But he saw the Medes that will come against the Babylonians, which, of course, happened. It happened and uh, it was fulfilled. Who is Isaiah speaking of when he says, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? A revelation of Satan, we would see. All right? and how did we arrive at this being the person of Satan? Because the one that's in rebellion here is rebelling against God and he is personified as the one who would arise against God. He's referred to as Lucifer, but Lucifer is really uh, the shining one, the one who shines. And so, but, but we believe it's a reference to Satan, of course. 
Everyone says Lucifer, naturally you think of Satan, and, and rightly so. But remember, keep in mind that the word Lucifer really mean, comes from the word to, to, to shine, to illuminate. <laughs> to illuminate. You know, um, when, when Pope Francis first became Pope, the first Easter uh, during his popeship, they sang a song that Easter morning that talked about the lifting up of Lucifer. Mentioned three times, I think, in this song that was sang in Latin on Easter morning. Mentioned Lucifer three times. And when they were challenged, the official website, the, the website of the Vatican said, oh, no, 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 we were not referring to the person of Lucifer. We were referring to the light, the shining aspect of Christ. That's, that's what they said. But they, they used the word Lucifer three times, referring to the illumination of Jesus. So strictly speaking, they were not wrong. But why do they have to use the word Lucifer? Why did they have to deliberately and purposely use the word Lucifer? Of course, uh, people that are far out on the other end of the conspiracy uh, spectrum began to squawk right away. And, and, and there's been a long-standing accusation against the Vatican, well, actually, the, the uh, Jesuits, that they are actually Luciferians, people that worship Lucifer. And, and, they, and, 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 and clearly, they introduced in a song on Easter morning at the rise of the very first Jesuit pope that mentions the word Lucifer three times. Yeah, it's kind of a giveaway, isn't it? But they did that. They did that. And, and, and to be frank with you, ever since that song has been sung, we've seen nothing but devilish behavior from this pope. Nothing but Luciferian behavior from this pope. He's been out, he's been out forming a new world order. He's forming a one world religion. He's getting Islam to sign on the dotted line along with Christianity to form an amalgamation religion. He's doing the work of Lucifer. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So, but uh, Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 14 this, this aspect of a uh, specter of, of Lucifer. All right. So, before I carried myself away, let's go back to, uh, all right. So, Philistia, a reference to Phil Philistia. Now, remember that the Philistines did not exist during the time of Isaiah. Yet Isaiah here is speaking prophetically, it's a prophetic message, of a people that will represent Philistia or the Palestinians. I, I listened to, I listened to a, a video today and some Arabs were speaking in Palestine and he referred to the word Palestine and the word that came out of his mouth was the Fishtim. He said the Fishtim. Palestinians. He said Philistines. He's referring to the Philistines. So when, when an Arab person says Palestinian, he literally says Philistines. So Isaiah here is talking about a time when God will bring judgment upon the Palestinians, the Philistine. Let's read it. Uh, what, what specifically will God do to the Philistines, to the Palestinians? He will destroy the very root of the Philistine people, the Pishtine people. So that tells us that the root that's being destroyed here is not a, a racial demographic. It is a spiritual demographic. Could we say that? Yes? It's a spiritual root. The root is not the physical DNA. In other words, the descendants of the Philistine people, the actual Philistine people, most of them would be found somewhere in Greece. They were Phoenicians. They were Phoenicians, and they were seafaring people. And finally, finally, they decided to jump on their ships and take off. Most of them went back to the region of uh, of, of of Greece, those islands out there, uh, and even as far as Spain and Portugal. They went out. They said this this conflict over the land of Israel is too much. We're leaving. They were they were they were they were commercial people. They were maritime commercial people that were not indigenous to the land, to the land of Canaan, which became the land of Israel. They were visitors, they were outsiders who came there to profiteer off of that land bridge. 
And they were weapon makers, they were traders. They, again, they were maritime people. And finally, King David and Solomon made enough war with them that he des they destroyed much of them. And the rest of the Philistines got on ships and they took off. But the spirit of the Philistine, the root of the Philistines, a people that would oppose Israel, well, they're still there today. And they're represented in the so-called Palestinian people. God is going to destroy that root. All right, so Moab, what specific sin is Moab guilty of? Pride. 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 And, and that certainly is the case even to today. Who are, they, who are the Moabites of today? The Jordanians. Jordanians are the Moabites of today. In fact, most of the people in the West Bank, uh, the Philistines of the West Bank, are actually Moabites. You know, genetically, most of them are actually Moabites. Damascus, what will happen to Damascus? It would be leveled. And Isaiah is not the only prophet that spoke about this. Isaiah is just one of the three prophets, I believe, that made reference to the ultimate destruction of Damascus. It would be destroyed. It would be laid waste completely. It says that the walls of Damascus would melt from the intense heat of its destruction. So there's been a lot of speculation about that. First of all, this prophecy appears with three different prophets. Isaiah most prominently. That prophecy has not been fulfilled. Damascus has never been destroyed. The walls of Damascus has been breached, but never has it been destroyed. Damascus was, Damascus, uh, the city of Damascus is perhaps the oldest standing city in all the world. All right, that's, that's just a fact. The oldest standing city in all the world. It's never been destroyed, it's been conquered. So what does, what does that tell us? that this prophecy concerning the destruction of Damascus is yet to be fulfilled. Its destruction is complete. Wasteland. It will become a wasteland. Not even the beasts would be able to exist in this, in this city once it's destroyed. So a lot of speculation that it's referring to a nuclear destruction. Uh, some sort of a nuclear weapon will destroy it. And that's, that seems to be a good speculation. All right, perhaps we have weapons that goes beyond nuclear weapons. <laughs> uh, but whatever happens, it's going to be enough to melt the walls of Damascus. Uh, often, sometimes, I would sit and ponder this, and I would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Damascus. Damascus is really the epicenter of Syria. It is Syria. Damascus is Syria, right? Syria has very little outside of Damascus. Damascus is a massive sprawl of a city. Damascus is effectively a conduit for Iran. Iran is working feverish, feverishly to, to, to have its own nuclear weapons. And what do they want to do with their nuclear weapons? Primarily destroy Israel. So I, I, I speculate and sometimes I, I, I conjure in my mind a scenario where perhaps uh, nuclear weapons are discovered in, in Damascus. Perhaps they would attempt to use a nuclear weapon against Israel from Damascus, and perhaps Israel would respond in kind and destroy Damascus. Or perhaps Israel would not have to, dis to, to respond, and perhaps Damascus will destroy itself. But the Bible refers to a destruction that will come upon this Damascus. So you can just picture some Syrians tinkering with a nuclear weapon. And which wire? This wire, that wire. Let's see. Boom. And there goes Damascus. A bomb that perhaps, a weapon that was perhaps designated for Israel, perhaps they would use against themselves, perhaps. At any rate, uh, we know that Damascus will be destroyed with incredible heat and an incredible destruction. Listen, no one wants to see an entire city destroyed with all of its inhabitants. It's not going to be attractive. I, I certainly don't want to see such a thing, but people will arise and thrive against God's people, and the, 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 the recompense for thriving against God's people is destruction. Any way you shake it. 
All right, so now Kush. Who is Kush? Kush is the people of North Africa, the Kushites. Uh, in fact, much of Africa would be considered Kushites. Who is Kush? He was the, the son of Ham, and he was the father of Nimrod. So the Kushite people would be the Hamedic people that, that settled in Africa. Originally, they were the people of Sumeria, the Sumerian people. And, and I think once God destroyed Babel, which, was, which became the capital of the Sumerian people, they simply got out of there real quick and ended up in Africa. But they were already in Africa. They, uh, they, the Egyptians were Kushite peoples. Uh, Mitzrayim, they were Kushites. Anyways, Kush. Eventually, the people of Kush will bring a gift of homage to the Lord. So that's, that's a hopeful and a positive uh, prophecy that the people of Kush, the African people, would bring homage to God. Right? And, and to be quite frank with you, uh, the African people today are very open to the nation of Israel. There is a, there is a contest for the African people. There's, a, there's a, a vying for the African people. Islam is working very hard to not control Africa, the continent, but to destroy it. Wherever you see the spread of Islam in the continent of Africa, you see destruction, mayhem. You see no life. You see literal destruction. Uh, but there you have many, many aspects or many, many facets of, African, of the African people that are eager to, uh, to establish relationship with Israel. And so this is what I believe it's referring to. Egypt. Egypt is referred to as God's people. Assyria, the work of his hands. And that reference is found in Isaiah chapter 19. So it, it refers to a time when, this is of course pointing to the millennial kingdom, when the nations of the world will bring themselves to submission to Israel and, and, and begin to serve Israel. That will happen. There's no question about that. Uh, Israel would be the head of the nations, not the tail. Israel will become the leading nations, and all the nations will come under its authority. And so certainly Egypt will do so. Uh, and Assyria, the, the remnants of Assyria. There, there are people today that descended from the Assyrians. They still speak Aramaic, which is the ancient language of Mesopotamia, the, the sons of Shem. right? So the sons of Shem spoke Aramaic. Aram was one of the sons of uh, Shem, or grandson, I'm not sure, can't remember. But they spoke Aramaic, which is a language, no doubt, that Noah spoke, the language that Abraham, or Avram spoke, Aramaic. All right? That's why I believe that the language uh, of the pre-flood civilization was, in fact, Aramaic, and not Hebrew. Because Hebrew formed from Aramaic. Hebrew formed in Egypt during that 400 year period when the sons of Israel, Yaakov, the sons of Israel went into Egypt speaking Aramaic. And they came out of Egypt with a, with a complete, completely new language, which was Hebrew. Now why would I say such a thing? Because Abraham spoke Aramaic. <laughs> he didn't speak Hebrew. Sounds crazy, right? But the research, the research, uh, the research indicates clearly that he was an Aramean and he spoke the Aramean language. Hebrew and Aramaic are very, very close. In fact, Hebrew is derived from Aramaic for that reason. I believe that Noah spoke Aramaic and the language before the flood was in fact Aramaic. And that's why Jesus on the cross spoke perfect Ar Aramaic. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He spoke such a perfect form of Aramaic that they couldn't understand it. They thought he was calling for Elijah. But that's what it says. He spoke Aramaic on the cross. So at the most passionate moment of his life, he didn't speak Hebrew. He spoke the ancient language, Aramaic. So I'm partial to Aramaic for that reason. I believe that God's language is Aramaic. The language that, 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 that uh, Adam spoke was Aramaic. Noah. Enoch, Aramaic. <laughs> Hebrew came as a result of the, 
the amalgamation of the culture that they experienced in Egypt, and out from that came that, that language. Very much Aramaic. In fact, ancient Hebrew, not the Hebrew of today, but ancient Hebrew, the Hebrew that the children of Israel spoke coming out of Egypt, was much closer to Aramaic than what they have today. All right, so that's, that's just a historic fact. All right, all right, it says here in chapter 21, the south country, the splendor of Kedah, or Arabia, will be terminated. So it doesn't look good for the, Arab, for the, for the Arabs, does it? Arabia is Kedah. Kedah is a reference to the sons of Ishmael, the people of, of Arabia. They would be terminated. Not good. Jerusalem, it says here, the Lord called Jerusalem to repentance and mourning, but instead they did what? They, they had a Eurovision con concert. Isn't that what they did? They invited Madonna over there and they had a concert. Yes, they invited Roger Waters, but he refused to go. But Madonna went and uh, they had a big party. Kind of stuffed it in God's eyes is what they did. All right, so Tyre, who are the people of Tyre? They're the Zidonians. Tyre, for what period of time will Tyre be destroyed? 70 years. Who destroyed Tyre? Alexander the Great. Tim's got it. Tim's got a hold on history. Alexander the Great marched against Tyre and destroyed it. Um, Ezekiel, in, in Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 28 spoke about the destruction of Tyre, the king of Tyre. But God had a real issue with the king of Tyre because he was a manifestation of Satan himself. That the king of Tyre was manifesting the very person of Satan. Uh, that's, in, uh, that's in Ezekiel chapter 28. And God said he's going to bring a people against them and, and destroy them, which is exactly what happened with Alexander the Great. Uh, the, 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 the kingdom of Tyre was the land of the Zidonians, but the king of Tyre, who was the high priest of Tyre, he lived on a small island right outside of Tyre that was impenetrable. The island was a fortress. And, and the, the Grecian troops, uh, uh, Alexander had a very hard time destroying it. And ultimately, he devised a way by which he could. And it's, it was an ingenious uh, device that he came up with, and he managed to destroy Tyre. So Tyre would be destroyed. Alexander the Great was God's instrument. And you see, this is something that, that, I all, that I always see, and it's hard for people to understand it, but Alexander the Great was God's man. Right up until he decided that he was a god himself. So when Alexander the Great began to become too great, too big for his britches, that's when he died, that's when he ceased to be effective. But God appointed, I'm going to say anointed, it's a tough word there, God appointed Alexander to do everything that he did. Mm -hmm. but, but when you look at the history, well, you have to look, not biblical history. Biblical history of Alexander is found in the book of Daniel. Right, the, the, the one horn, the, the ram from the west that came with one horn, and he came and he, he destroyed the goat with the two horns, referring to the Medo-Persian Empire. Clearly, that was Alexander the Great, right? And, and that's where it begins and that's where it ends. But conventional history, or con yeah, conventional shows that he had favor for, he had favored the Jewish nation. And one, a high, the high priest at that time, this is conventional history, the high priest of Jerusalem, who was in Jerusalem at that time, made peace with Alexander, and Alex, Alexander actually uh, revered the God of Israel. He had respect for the God of Israel. He didn't destroy Jerusalem. He passed by and, and went on to, to his other campaigns. God used him to destroy the, the Medo-Persian Empire, but I think at that point, Alexander, his purpose was to turn around and go back to where he came from. But he didn't. 
he decided to keep marching eastward uh, where he encountered the Hindus. And that was not a good encounter because the Hindus had war elephants that destroyed his army. Even after his army was destroyed and defeated, he didn't turn around to go back because at that point, the peoples that he had began to encounter were lifting him up as if he was a god figure. And once Alexander was lifted up as a, a god figure, that was it. He died. <laughs> his work was over. But Alexander was a good picture of a good leader. He was a wonderful picture of a leader. Uh, you know, in the campaigns that he fought against the Persians, against the people of Tyre, all of the peoples that God had, had appointed him to conquer, he was the first guy over the wall. This was, this was one of the most amazing things about Alexander. And the Persian kings couldn't understand it. That this guy over this, this guy that's hopping the wall, he's the king, he, he's Alexander. They couldn't get it. Because in, in a, from a Persian mindset, the king is way back there somewhere, protected by the army. But Alexander, he's the guy that's coming over the wall and rushing the army. And he became known as Alexander the Great because of that. Of course, he, 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 he had much conquest and he was great also because of that. But all right, so Alexander destroyed Tyre. He railed against Tyre. Okay, so where did we leave? Where did we stop? Okay. No, we're in study I two now, aren't we? <laughs> Section one. All right. Isaiah sees a complete destruction coming upon the whole earth. What is the cause of this destruction? We read this two weeks ago. We said that the inhabitants had transgressed natural laws, has had offended God with their behavior. I think we talked about that quite a bit. And so, what do we see today? We see Natural laws being broken. Natural laws being broken. And, and, and it's happening all around us. We're seeing things <laughs> in God's creation that should never exist. Should never occur. Natural laws are being broken. At the end, the Lord will reign on and in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. A strong people will glorify God because he has become a, a defense for the hopeless, for the helpless, a defense, right, a refuge, uh, correct, a refuge from the storm. Isaiah says that God will swallow up death. What is he speaking of? Uh, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, death, where is your sting? He's referring to resurrection, uh, the new creation form, which is the resurrection. So he will swallow up death with the hope of the first fruits, resurrection. The inhabitants of the earth learn righteousness when? When they experience judgment. They will learn righteousness or respect for God they would learn right behavior when God brings judgment upon them. How successful is man when he attempts, to del attempts deliverance of the earth? So we mentioned the UN a few moments ago, right? 72, 72 years ago, this organization came along and said, well, it's up to us to provide salvation for man. It, that's what they said. And, and right in front of their building, they quoted Isaiah that they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. What's the statement? They're saying by our efforts, by man's resolve, we're going to provide a kingdom, a utopian kingdom. We're going to enforce peace in the earth. And that's what, how does God feel about that? <laughs> uh, he, he, he doesn't think much about it. And so that's what we do, right? We're, we're, we're man. We're, we're, without God, we're pretty hopeless, right? So I'm, I'm ministering to someone right now who grew, grew up as a believer, 
cried out to God readily and loudly and, and loved God and expressed his love for God. Along the way, people decided to challenge him. He looked strong, but he really wasn't that strong. He was crying out for strength. And people decided to challenge him to the point of crushing him. And yeah, he, was, he received their, their love, their Christian love, and he believed that he was crushed. And so he turned away from God. And so now I'm in the process of, of that, bringing him to that point of return. And he's coming along. He's coming along. So he's coming back to that place where he's going to, he's, he's beginning to see that his strength comes from God and not from man's opinion about him, which is, which is always wonderful to see when people come to that place. All right? So, let's see. Ooh. Section two already? No. Seven. Right. Jacob will fill the earth with, with fruit. Amen. All right. So section two now. We have a little time. God will lay in Zion a cornerstone. A cornerstone. That cornerstone can easily be Messiah Jesus or the ministry of Messiah Jesus Paul, in the book of Ephesians, I think Ephesians chapter 2, he referred to Jesus being the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone. Peter referred to the living stone that Jesus is. So you put those two together, Peter said that Jesus is the living stone, rejected by man, but choice, God's perspective, but he's also the cornerstone. So the cornerstone here, I believe, is the Jesus, or the ministry of Jesus. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Building upon this foundation, God will make justice, the measuring line, and righteousness, a plumb line or a level. Isaiah, Isaiah has heard from, has heard what from the Lord God? Chapter 28, a decisive destruction. Sure and determined destruction will come upon the nations. Ariel means lion of God, the significance of, uh, and signifies Jerusalem. What is coming upon Ariel? Distress, distress and destruction, which has occurred uh, twice since this prophecy was spoken, 586 BC and 70 AD. Judah, cry, uh, Judah tried to gain help by relying on, on Egypt. Shouldn't have done that. The land will be desolate until God, God pours out his, his spirit. So the land of Israel, and this is also repeated in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36. The land of Israel will be revived when God pours out his spirit upon the land. The same thing is stated in, in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, many people, they go to Israel, and those of us that are sensitive to God's Spirit, we go there, and almost immediately we come in contact with a different, a different land, or the Spirit of God, which makes that land different. Right? And so what is it about the land of Israel? that you go there and you immediately f you feel like you're in the presence of God. Well, because God has put his spirit upon the land. It's part of the restoration process. And so that, that's literally being fulfilled right now. Okay, so make a note there, uh, folks, and next week we'll come back to that particular spot in our study guide. So we have five more classes. If we go to... Uh, June 24th. And that will give us enough time to wrap up Isaiah and to do it carefully. Have a good week. The people of who? Ariel. <laughs> well, they believe that that judgment has already been been uh, carried out. It's been executed against them, and so... Yeah.
They, they're not seeing it from that point of view. They're seeing it from a, from a fulfilled point of view that, that uh, that prophecy is done, it's over.